Hey guys, this is Marita Carfrey and you are listening to the One Moment Longer podcast. All right, today I am welcoming back a legend of the triathlon world. She's a a three-time Ironman world champion and Ironman 70.3 world champion and just one of the most formidable athletes I think we've ever seen do the sport. She's a professional athlete that just illustrates the show's mantra, which is success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. And she was first on the show way back Episode number six, I believe, of February 2020, one of my very first interviews. Um, so it's really great to have her coming back on. She's recently made the, the tough decision to retire, and we'll be discussing that in this show and, and how she came to that decision and what that process was like. And then I just sort of want to look at her career and, and go back and look at some of the most memorable moments, discuss some of the highs and lows, and, and just even get a glimpse into some of the most epic workouts that she's done. We'll talk about the evolution of the sport and where the sport's at now. And then of course, what's happening after her professional racing career. But she's been a really very close and great friend for many years. And I'm excited to have her back on the show for this catch up. So welcome. And thanks for coming back to the One Moment Longer podcast, Marinda Caffrey. How are you, Rini? I'm great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Yeah, it's good to be back on. It's good to chat with you. Uh, Mm. Obviously, we spent a lot of time back in the day training together sort of later in your career and sort of almost in the prime of mine. Mm. Uh, But yeah, some memorable moments training with yourself and uh, your lovely wife, Laura. Yeah, Um, yeah, we miss you guys now that you've moved on to Florida. I know, I know. It's kind of funny, you know, uh, we moved down here to Florida about, you know, several years ago out of Boulder largely because a lot of our friends were still very much in the world of triathlon and, and you kind of go, well, we're not really in it anymore. Uh, how are we getting along with you guys? So, But it's been really epic to just watch you and, and obviously your husband, Timothy O'Donnell, good mate of mine, you know, having such unbelievable careers. Now you're in your early 40s, you've got several kids. I mean, how's that whole process been of getting to this point of making that decision to retire? Well, first of all, we're all retiring out here now. <laughs> GB, <laughs> the great community. Uh, Rachel Willis is retired. Oh, she is. Mary yeah. Miller obviously has kids and myself. And yeah, um, yeah lots of ex professional triathletes now just moving into the, you know, parenthood world. But uh, yeah, more to your question, um, how was the decision to retire? Honestly, it was really easy. Um, and I couldn't be more happy with the decision and with where I'm at right now in my life. Uh, sort of later in my career, you sort of speak to some other triathletes and that was like, just keep racing as long as you can hold on. Like it was almost like nothing's better after. And I think for myself, I just, I can look back at my career and yeah, there's some races I think I could have done better or there's some things I could have done better or races that I, I could have won that one. But really I had a pretty fairy tale career. I mean, I won at the highest level. I got to compete um, in Kona many, many times and have really good results there, which is really my main goal in my triathlon life. And, you know, 2020 happened and that was actually going to be my last year of triathlon. Um, I was planning to race Kona that year. Uh, 19 actually was potentially going to be my last Kona. Um, and I broke my arm five weeks out. I was like feeling like I was really ready to have a great performance there. And I thought I could, you know, maybe step on that top step one more time, but broke my arm five weeks out and it just wasn't meant to be. And so I'm like, okay, we'll do it in 20, 2020. And Tim and I knew we wanted to have another baby too. So we're sort of like, okay, we'll put the, having the baby off. And then obviously the pandemic happened and Kona got canceled and we got to work right away and created it. <laughs> <laughs> got to work. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we were one of the first to be like, well, nothing's happening. I may as yeah. well make use of my time. And we're fortunate to fall pregnant really quickly with um, with Finn. And I, you know, used that 2020 time wisely. We had Finn the beginning of 2021 and um, came back to racing in 21. But honestly, like my heart really wasn't in it. I feel like once I, even right after I had him, I remember, you know, it was sort of three, four weeks after. And I actually remember talking to Laura and I'm like, I just don't even feel like training. I don't feel like running. I have no desire to go and hurt myself. I have no desire to just, cause you know, the hill you have to climb, right. To get back up there. Um, and then we're just like, well, but I do want to get back in shape. So I may as well go and, you know, you, you want to get yourself back active after having your child and lose the baby weight. And so I'm like, well, I'll just do that and sort of see what eventuates. And 
obviously I had some fantastic supporters to in sponsors. And, and so, you know, you want to do, you know, them proud after sort of supporting you through a pandemic. And, and so, yeah, I sort of got myself back in shape and I'm like, well, you know, I feel good enough to go and race. Uh, and yeah, did a few races. I started racing in sort of late 2021 and, and I was doing okay. I mean, nothing like prior to, um, having Finn, but sort of getting okay results. And, um, then came into 2022 and I sort of thought maybe I'd do an Ironman in 22. And I quickly disposed of that idea. Uh, once I realized that I just wasn't willing to do the 30 hour weeks anymore. I wasn't willing to go and ride my bike for endless hours and just be exhausted every single day because my priorities are like, not that they hadn't shifted with Isabel with Isabel. I think we had, I don't know. I still had just a little bit of a fire for the sport, but once I had Finn, it was just like, no, like is Isabel's getting big now. She wants to play soccer. Like I want to be able to take her to the park and ride a bike and have the energy to do that. And obviously Finn was an infant, but I'm like, it went really quick. You know, she's three and a half, four, Mm -hmm. he's like, you know, turning one soon. I want to have the energy to just spend that time with the kids and enjoy them while they're young. Because as I said, I think I realized just how quickly it went with Isabel and I just didn't want to miss anything with Finian. Um, so yeah, I, I think just, it was a, just a priority shift. I'm sorry for the clomping sounds upstairs. That, that is my two children. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is the only way I'd want to be doing this episode is to make sure we have the kids in the background thumping. And actually my kids, I, I try and send out, they could be rushing, rushing in at any point as well. But it's funny, you know, you, you, you talk about that and it, I think there's a lot, of, obviously, you know, when, when you're a mum, your body goes through a whole heap of changes, right? And the hormones and, you know, you think of the oxytocin levels and the love that you have. Your love moves from sort of ambition and career to your kids, right? And so it's like this, as much as you try and overpower it and go, oh, I, I, want it, I should get back, I should get back. It's like you're drawn so strongly that there's no way you can not, be there and want, and it changes your perspective entirely. A hundred percent. And that, and that's uh, definitely how I felt. And that's not to say that anyone, I think that as a female athlete, you can have a baby and come back and still be competitive at the highest level. I mean, women are doing it and showing, um, that it can be done, but I think for me in my, the stage of my career and what I'd already done in the sport, it was almost like, well, there's nothing I can do better in the triathlon world. And then look at this amazing, life that I'm building together with my husband, Tim, and our, our kids, like there's nothing to me more important than them right now. And I think, yes, I think as a mom, um, having a child, but still having huge ambition is, is a different mindset. And I think it was just that I was at that stage of my career where it was like, no, like I've worked really, really, really hard for a really long time. It's been an over 20 year career. I've achieved at the highest level and there's nothing more important to me now than just being the best mom I can be, being present for my children and having the energy for them, right? Like, yeah. you know, like if you're training for Ironman or 70.3 or oh, Olympic distance, yeah. any of it, like it takes every ounce of your soul to to do the work necessary to compete at the highest level. And, and actually that's the way I found it to be anyway. I mean, I don't know um, if that's the same for everyone, but uh, I certainly know for myself, my husband, like you have to squeeze every ounce of everything out of yourself, you know, every single day. Yeah. yeah, It's constant. And then, yeah. Like how do you do that? And then raise children, you know, like for me, I was like, okay, I just can't do both. And so, yeah, as I said, in my last year, 2022, I was sort of, I felt like I was, you know, I was training like 17 hours a week and I was competing. Okay. But again, my heart wasn't in it. So I sort of got to the end of that year and was like, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. I love, I love that you got to have it all. If you know what I mean? It's like, you got to have an outstanding career, you know, out, truly outstanding, one of the all-time greatest careers. And to your point earlier when you said, I've already achieved the highest <laughs> the thing that you, you, everyone's aspiring to in the sport, and that's, you know, the Kona Ironman World Championships. You did that three times. You won it. You are on the podium multiple times after that. But then you've also got to be a mother, which is, you know, I don't think – people realize until they are mums just how awesome that experience is. And I think it's great that people don't know what that experience is like unless they are a mother because, you know, you've got to have it all. And Laura often talks about that. She goes, I was very fortunate to have it all. I got to be, follow my passion, my career. 
uh, try and be the greatest I could be. But then I also got to be a mother and fully embrace watching them grow up and, and, and being a part of that. I, I want to um, just step back a little bit. Um, you know, like I said, it's been almost three and a half years since we had you last on the show, which I can't believe. Yeah. And let's just do a real quick recap of your triathlon journey for, for listeners, you know, so they can get an understanding of how did you get into the sport? You know, tell us a bit about those early years in your sport. What was that inspiration, you know, to even do triathlon? My start to the sport was sort of a little different from a lot of triathletes I, in that I didn't come from an endurance background at all, swimming, cycling, or running. I played basketball growing up and uh, actually didn't enjoy running at all. I got roped into doing cross country and I was good at it, you know, in in high school and I got roped into doing all of the track and field events and sort of a good all around athlete, but didn't see the point in just running, you know, cause I, I was so like passionate about playing basketball, but I never grew past like five, three. And so basketball became a frustrating thing in that I was the fittest, um, most agile, uh, player on the court, but I was quite literally overlooked so often for different teams because of my height. And I would see these, you know, taller women that were out of shape, um, not the most coordinated, but they were big and you could throw the ball into them and they could put it in the hoop, um, quite easily. So, um, yeah, it was just a a frustrating sport. And I actually was in the gym trying to get a little bit stronger, um, to deal with the larger women. At that point I was playing sort of open league and I was about 17, 18 years old. And in the summertime, um, me and a couple of my teammates who are also smaller in stature guards, um, we wanted to just bulk up a little bit, um, put on a little muscle and, um, get ready for the upcoming basketball season. And, and that's where I met a couple of triathletes. And even though I am Australian and triathlon really was booming, um, this was like 99, 98, um, in Australia, we had, you know, the best athletes in the world. I didn't know what triathlon was. Um, and I was like, wait, you do swimming, cycling and running. And then, you know, there's all these different distances and you can, you can actually make a living at this sport. And so it kind of opened my eyes to, wow, that actually sounds like appealing. And it sounded appealing because it seemed like the athlete that was willing to do the work didn't matter about talent, whatever. The athlete that was willing to do the work day in, day out was the athlete who had the success and who won the race ultimately. And so I'm like, well, that sounds like me. Like I'm willing to do the work. I am, you know, not going to be the most talented athlete, but I know I'm resilient. And, um, so yeah, so it didn't take long, maybe like six or eight months for them to talk me into, well, first of all, they, the coach asked me to come and do some run sessions as well. So we would, we would lift weights Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, they would run. And so they invited us to come and do some running and, you know, I'd never really run before, but we'd go and uh, do their run sessions. And then eventually the coach said, you know, you have a really nice run, nice run form. Have you ever, I think you'd make a really good triathlete. Have you ever considered it? And that was kind of already sort of in the back of my mind, but I like would never have like just signed up for triathlon on my own volition. It would, I needed like somebody to be like, Hey, I think you should do this. And yeah, I remember that one day, like Clearly, I I went off to work afterwards. I was working at Bunnings Warehouse, which is a hardware store. (laughs) Bunnings. (laughs) (laughs) And I just remember just having this like excitement, like in my belly the whole day. I was just like, I don't, and I had no reason. I didn't even know how to swim, you know, like, I mean, I could swim to save myself, but I've never swum a lap, you know, in my life. And I didn't own a bike, but I had this weird, like, just gut feel that this is something, something I should pursue. And so, you know, fast forward, that was like 99. Um, I did my first triathlon that, you know, start of that summer, the end of that year. And then sort of, you know, by 2001, I was in the Australian junior team. So it was kind of like, wow, I spent sort of 11 years playing basketball and scraped into a state team and sat on the bench. Um, and after sort of really only a year of, I guess maybe two years of sort of putting my energy into triathlon. I'm on Australian team and traveling internationally. So I was like, this is, 
this is what I should be doing. You know, the biggest takeaway from that for me was that you worked at Bunnings. I had no idea that you worked at Bunnings. Pretty good, Jimmy, because remember, you know, I, we love the sausage sizzle. I know you love the sausage. So- okay, let me frame this for, for listeners. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of US and European listeners. So Bunnings is our big, for Americans, it's like our home depot, but it's it's even better. And they, is it just on weekends? They have this thing called a, a sausage sizzle, which basically <laughs> they you fry it up and what is it? You pay a buck or whatever, and they put a little bit yeah. of white bread and you throw sausages in and some fried up onions and sauce. Anyway, the smell of it when you come out of, you know, the hardware store is you have to have it. It's like this. <laughs> it's like Pavlo's dog, isn't it? You worked at Bunnings and what, what I did. How did I not know this? I've known you for 20 years. <laughs> um, I don't know. I thought you knew that. Um, I worked in the leisure section. So I sold, you know, outdoor settings and barbecues. And- I love it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, and then fast forward, you know, your career, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to celebrate your career a little bit. So I, you know, when you, when you think about some of the greatest highs, when you look back now from your career, is there anything that really, a couple of moments that really stand out to you? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I think one of them was like very early in my career. And I think throughout my triathlon early career anyway, I sort of, I needed like, you know, I had sort of benchmarks to like allow myself to continue on this somewhat selfish pursuit and that like I wasn't really making any money and I was putting my university studies on hold and I was sort of gambling a lot on this triathlon dream. And I remember 2002, it was my second world championship event in Cancun, Mexico. I raced the under 23 division and the year before I finished near last in the under 19 race. Uh, and then fast forward, I think it was like a year and a half later because just the world champs fell later in the year because Cancun, they couldn't host till November. And I think the year before it was late like July. So I had a good amount of time to train, but I ended up um, finishing second. Um, but I out sprinted and then basically battled all day with Nicola Spearing and she was the champion from the year before. So the, the woman who was, you know, probably the most talented, famous, um, young, uh, younger, you know, junior athlete, was racing in my race and I ended up beating her. And so I was like, holy wow, like this isn't, isn't happening. So that was kind of my first real like mm. aha moment. Where I like, can do okay, this. I can do this. Yeah. I can do like, she's the best in the world. Yeah. And, yeah. And I just beat her in a sprint finish and her thing is running. So yeah. So ha- having that was a really nice early stepping stone to like, yes, you're on the right track you know, keep pursuing this goal. Back then I was sort of more focused on Olympic distance and trying to go to the Olympics, but my eyes were sort of starting to open to Ironman. And, you know, a couple of years later, I sort of realized that, okay, Ironman was probably really where my talents would lie. And um, yeah, I mean, winning this, you know, 2007, uh, 70.3 world, world title was, was big, but it was really, you know, winning in Kona. I mean, those, those victories and in particular, I think 2010 was kind of, I almost wasn't ready for it and it, it felt like I sort of cheated a little bit because Chrissy Wellington, who was the reigning world champion, uh, pulled out the morning of the race. So I did win that one, but the defending champ was out. And then, but 2013, that year, I feel like I put together just a perfect race and my training was spot on all year. And yeah, I, I went a really fast time and um, that one was pretty special. Uh, 2014 was special too for different reasons, but yeah, I think, yeah, any of those championship victories are pretty special. Do you ever have the feeling along the way where it was like, is this happening to me? Did it feel surreal or did you feel like it it, it was meant to, be, meant to be? Um, A little bit of both. I think um, around 2006, 2007, I sort of started, because I was always that athlete, like, oh, that couldn't happen for me. Like, oh, I'm not good. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly be the world champion. And then I started to be like, well, why not? Like, what makes someone else better? better than like, why did they deserve to win and not me? And so it was kind of like that, why not me mentality, um, that started to come about sort of 2006 and and seven, ultimately when I won that 70.3 world championship. And then, yeah, it was, I think 2010, that victory in 2010 was surreal just because the whole day was crazy. Like thinking I was, and training to race Chrissy Wellington all year long. And then her bike was racked next to mine because I'd finished second to her the year before. And then like sort of getting my bike ready and seeing her bike is just sitting there and not, she's not there. Uh, and then they announced over the loudspeaker that she wasn't going to be racing. And so it was kind of like, what? <laughs> um, wait, now I have all the pressure because now I'm the 
person who was right, you know, right, right. yeah. And so the whole race was just I swam like the best I'd ever swum in my life. Like I think <laughs> that also showed me that pressure was a good thing for me because all of a sudden I swam like I've never swum that well again, never before in my career, but I swam in the front pack. Um, and then I was like, well, now what? Like I'm already in the front pack. I'm used like, to chasing. I'm, just, I'm already here. Now what do I do on the bike? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just had to like sort of, you know, hold my own on the bike and then, um, yeah, just – put together a run I know I'm capable of and I usually have to rely on. So it almost felt like too easy. That shock in the morning like enabled me to have like an out-of-body experience on the swim and then uh, my whole day was set up. It was almost like, okay, well, this is going to happen no matter what. So that was just a weird experience that day. And so the self-talk in that race was completely different than you'd been preparing for. It's like I often talk, you know, about visualizing and what you, and then all of a sudden your whole visual has been flipped on its head. I'm like, well, now what do I say to myself? <laughs> I wasn't yeah. ready for this. I thought I'd be chasing all day and having to stay, keep my head in the game. And it's like, my head's in the game. I'm, what? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think, um, you know, we talk about it all the time, like pre- having all the different scenarios played out in your mind. Yeah. Um, and I had like all year long, like thought about the race backwards, forwards, this happens, that happens like every, but in every instance, Chrissy was in the race (laughs) and then she wasn't in the race and it was like, well, okay, this is, you know, what the heck do I do now? And so, um, and and then, so winning that race, that really did change. I mean, you won 70.3 worlds a couple of years before, but that one really put you on the radar now for both sponsorships and media attention and, and pressure, you know, on performances. Did it, did it take any of the joy away from the sport or did it heighten the sport for you? Uh, Well, I feel like when I first stepped onto the scene in Ironman, I feel like I already had all of the pressure on my shoulders. So like Mm. that was the biggest year. So coming from, you know, being a world champion in 07 to going to Kona, it was almost like everyone was looking to me to be the one to, uh, challenge Chrissy. And I'm like, wait a minute, I've never even done an Ironman. This <laughs> nine was my first ever, a t- 10 was my second ever Ironman. So nine was my first ever Ironman. And I, you know, like going to the press conference and so forth is usually reserved for, you know, prior world champions, like decorated Ironman athletes. And I, I had to go to the press conference in 09 and I'm like, I've never even done this distance. <laughs> you know, yes, I had like Siri and myself, like we had a very small circle who knew like that, or who believed that, yes, I, I could race at the top level, but it was almost like everyone already expected that. So yeah. I think coming in in 09 and dealing with like basically the circus that is Kona, and I, I did have some good sponsors before 09, but nothing like sort of after 09 and then obviously winning the world title in 10. Honestly, it just opened up a lot more opportunities for me and – I don't know. I think I won, I won in 10 and I just was like, well, this might ne- never happen to me again in my life. I need to take every single opportunity mm, mm. offered to me. And that's looking back, probably one of my biggest regrets because all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, I'll go and do a speaking engagement. Yeah. I'll go and, you know, fly to this race for a small appearance fee. And, and it wasn't sticking to, you know, the formula that got me to that place, you know, like being so meticulous in how we planned the year out, what, what races we did, when I traveled, when I rested, Mm. it was almost like, yeah, let's party. Let's go and do like, 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 let's take every check. And these were small little, you know, here's thousand dollars, here's five grand, here's, you know, to go and do a race somewhere. And so I was doing the, I was taking those opportunities just because I was like, well, who knows if I'll ever get this opportunity again. And then, yeah, it's kind of one of my, my, one of my, you know, not many, but one of my regrets in my career that I didn't just be like, okay, let's build on this. I can't tell you how many guests I've had on this, on this show that have said, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't take time to really celebrate that one world championship I got or that one moment that was super special. I quickly went and prepared for the next. And it's, it's almost the contrarian argument to your what you're saying you know what I mean it's like you're almost damned if you do damned if you don't you know you either celebrate and then you're like oh maybe I did I said yes to too many things and I shouldn't have or you didn't say yes to anything and you kind of missed the opportunity to I don't know you don't meet Greg like we celebrated every single big one. <laughs> so regardless, I was going to celebrate that win, but I think once it was time to go back to training, like we, you know, there's a time, you know, right? Like yeah. 
celebrate uh, until the end of the year or whatever and then, okay, let's buckle down and get back to work. And I just wish that in 2011 I just didn't, you know, didn't because I remember Siri saying, oh, you know, like I think I don't think you should do that race. And I was like, no, I'm going to go do it. And it was like an easy five grand or whatever for a half Ironman somewhere. And I, I remember it being like, I don't, it's not a good idea. And I'm like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. You're right. Like it's sort of a catch 22. You want to be able to celebrate the big moments and take every opportunity, but also like, how do you keep progressing and um, see what else you're capable of? One of my favorite things about your career was you, you did pace yourself well every year. Um, I think every year we started with Tio, myself, Laura, having wins, you know, 70.3s, or I was shorter distance, Laura was in the ITU, and we'd all be crushing it. And you'd be a little bit slower to the, you know, uptake at the start of the year. And then come Kona, come October, you'd be like, whack. <laughs> and we'd all be like, and there she does it again. Uh, <laughs> it was, it became almost notorious that we would, you know, be going, well, it's okay. Even though, because you'd have these months where your performances weren't amazing, they were okay. You'd have more pressure on you because you were the world number one and everything else and you weren't maybe performing and we were all getting our little wins and celebrating in sort of, you know, May, June, July. And then you would come and go whack and there was a real method to your madness, wasn't there? Yeah, I mean, we always, like I think I was pretty adamant that my year needed to be split up and that, you know, like the early season and then take a break, take a week off, um, reset, and then sort of the championship season. Um, and it was all just building towards like building towards Kona. And then I'd have a real break at the end of the year. So yeah, like yeah. it would take me a while and that sucked like <laughs> racing in May and just getting crushed. Um, it was hard mentally, but I always sort of would just sort of go back to, you know, that's just how we designed the year and it was very successful. So we had no reason to change it. Right. So even though it was hard to take those defeats in the early part of the year, you know, I'd take them over and over again, if it meant I got to win in Kona and, you know, I learned very quickly that no one cares what you do all year. If you can win the biggest race, then that's all that matters. 100%. Um, and yeah, so I planned my whole year around Kona and it, and it paid off. I mean, I was, you know, I put all my eggs in one basket. And unfortunately, it paid off for me. Yeah. So, how, you, what was it? It was three wins and three wins, two seconds, one, one third. Is that what it? Uh, three wins, uh, three seconds, and one third, and one fifth. It really is an extraordinary resume at the Big Island. I don't know many athletes, up and coming, inspiring professional athletes, that wouldn't want that career. It puts you in a very very few that have ever done anything remotely close to that. When, when you look back at the epic workouts you did, is there anything that stands out from some of the amazing training? You know, nothing really stands out. You know, like you hear about like, you know, the Sutton group doing like, I don't know, crazy track workouts and then running up a mountain home or some crazy stuff like that. And we did little, like I ran up to Ward a couple of times um, and that's like a what 16 mile straight uphill climb run, but it's not like, it's like two hours and 20 minutes or something. Um, but I think what I look back on was just my consistency. It was mm. just, I had a 20 year career with zero injuries. So I should say one injury. I broke my arm in uh, 19, five weeks before Kona. And I think that was because I was breastfeeding Isabel, um, for, you know, so long and, and then training at that highest level. Um, and I just depleted myself a little too much, but, um, yeah. Like I never had a running injury, um, that took me out for more than like a day, wow. you know, maybe I'd get a little sore or a little niggle. And that is really, it was just a consistency. It was week in, it was week out. It was the daily grind, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year that I think is what really is the underlying reason for my success. It wasn't like, like, yeah, we did some big workouts. Like, you know, we go and ride that five hour ride, um, with like the last hour, just max on the bike and then, you know, then do like 10 by a mile, but that's not crazy. I mean, it's not outrageous. It's not like, uh, sorry, Gustav and, um, Christian yeah. doing a marathon the weekend before Kona, like that's crazy, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like my training was just normal. Like we yeah. were smart, we did the work, we recovered and we just kept 
turning up and doing the work week after week. And like some of my big run sessions that were my bread and butter were like my 20 by three minutes on the treadmill. We did that like almost weekly coming into Kona. Um, and you know, at like 18 kilometers an hour, which is, you know, Olympic distance pace. So with sort of short rest. So as I got fitter, you know, the sessions became more impressive, but it still wasn't like I wasn't running marathon. In fact, quite the opposite. I never ran over sort of two and a half hours in training and never ran, you know, probably my longest run would have been 35 K, um, mm. in training and yeah, never, never more than that. So yeah, it wasn't the big epic sessions. It was just the consistency. That's something about that though, isn't it? It's like, like you said, almost 20 years of hardly mm-hmm. missing a beat. Yeah. Consistency, consistency, consistency. It's like we, if you have to have big rests in your training, your training's probably not right. If you have, if you are getting injured or if you, your training's probably not right. The, it's like you found the perfect way to keep your body going. You know, did you find, um, you know, talking about physically being able to keep going, did you have massive lulls mentally or emotionally with the sport in that period? Uh, really massive ones. And I think, I I think the reason for that is we sort of identified sort of early in my long course career and that when I stepped up to 70.3 distances, it started, you know, being, you know, more consistently training in the U S and in Boulder at altitude sort of identified that I needed to break my year up and that was enough for me. So like we would plan a really cool vacation in July. Like we'd hit like Vine Man or a 70.3 sometime mid year later on, it might've been Roth or I'm in Austria, but mid year we would do a week vacation and we'd go and spend a bunch of money and <laughs> go somewhere cool and just not do anything triathlon related. And that for me was like mentally enough downtime for me to then be excited again to get back to work. And that excitement sort of carried me through. Okay. Now it's championship season. Now we're getting ready for Kona. And then after Kona, we're going to do something else really cool. Like we're going to go another really cool vacation. And that's, that was sort of always the reward. And I think always having those, you know, they they weren't really that far off. It wasn't like I was going like a year before having like a real, like opportunity to blow off some steam and, you know, and after a race, you know, we might go out and have a few drink, have a few too many drinks, um, <laughs> and have like a few, like, you know, days of training that were, you know, obviously you'd need to recover anyway, but, um, not optimal. We always sort of tried to enjoy the process and realize that this was just such a, a an amazing opportunity to be flying around the world and racing in these cool places mm-hmm. and, and doing it with, you know, you know, the, my now husband, I think we were really good at putting it into perspective all the time. And, and obviously I had really good guidance in my coach, Siri Lindley over the years, um, always supporting me and having my back and, and making sure I, um, took downtime when was necessary and, and pushed me a little harder when maybe when was necessary, it was more her pulling me back than anything. And, and, um, you know, my management team, Shannon and, and wing over the years were always really good support taking care of the business side of things. So yeah, I think having a really good team and then, making sure you're taking that downtime every year. Because I think, you know, I see so many athletes just like, you know, they finish a big race and then two days later they're in the pool doing a really hard session, you know, mm-hmm. and this might be a championship race. I'm like, what, why? Like you need to let your body recover, not only your body, more your mind. Like, don't you want to just like sit around and do nothing for a couple of days? Like, yeah. you know, for me, I needed that. And, um, I think it helps me. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I love that you mentioned your team because I wanted to talk about that next because I think that was, if you think about some of your secret weapons, yes, you had amazing run form if you want to get specific, but it was your consistency over years. But then also this this team that you had, obviously with Tio right behind you, you know, right beside you, you know, him being a professional triathlete himself, understands everything you're going through, the fatigue, the mental, emotional, everything about it. Laura and I had this it's similar and it's, there's some real power in that, but then also your relationships with, with Siri, your coach and and with Shannon and wing, you know, your managers who you knew had your back and, and Mm -hmm. were taking care of business on their side. You know, the trust that you had in, in your team was second to none. I think that was one of the most powerful things you had. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And then, and you add to that, like training partners, you know, like Mm -hmm. I've had really great training partners over the years and in Julie Dibbins and Laura Bennett, um, in, uh, who else? I mean, there's a number of athletes that over the years, they really lift you, you know, when you're, when you have a really good 
training partner who like complements your training and can push you sometimes and you can push them sometimes. And there's, well, there's a rivalry. It's more like a, like, I want to see you crush it if I'm not going to crush it, you know, Mm -hmm. sort of thing. And that was really needed as well. I think, Mm -hmm. I think, Mm -hmm. I don't think you can do it by yourself and yes, coaches and managers and partners and everything have to be on board, but yeah, having train really good training partners too also really helps things along. Yeah. I want to move, I want to move on. Um, the sport of a whole triathlon, you know, you've now been in it for 23 years or whatever. Um, you've seen it grow and change. You know, if you look at the events, the athletes, the technology, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the sport? Yeah. I mean, I think in recent years, you can't um, ignore the, you know, the, more science coming into the sport and you know obviously the Norwegian boys are sort of a shining example of of that just like now we're lactate testing you know every quality session now we're like more deeply looking into how well you're recovering like exactly what you know zones work for you as an individual athlete I mean I didn't do any of that stuff. Um, you know, I like <laughs> me either. A, me either. I'm uh, kind of glad I didn't have to. <laughs> uh, me, me too. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I barely had a Garmin. I think it was later in my career that I had a Garmin to like know what paces I was. Most of the time, I just went out and ran, you know. Yeah, and then, yeah. yes, I had like the treadmill session that I do once a week, and then you know the measured miles, or sometimes we go on the track. But yeah, and then p- the power power meet obviously came in, sort of. I guess sort of. It, it was there throughout my um, long course career. Um, but like riding to power, um, honestly, my coach more prescribed go hard, go easy, go medium. And that was sort of it. <laughs> and that's sort of how I trained. Um, yeah. yeah. Now it's just so much more specific. Um, obviously another big thing that changed throughout my career was like, all of a sudden it wasn't just about who won the race. It was about who won the race and who also could have like a great you know, social media oh, present. Yes, yes, yes. And that part of the business side of um, being a professional athlete just got more complicated and just harder. Like all of a sudden now you've got a video, you know, you've got a, so in my career, obviously you have a coach and I had a manager. Um, that's sort of the old school. And then now you need to get a visit videographer and someone to do your, um, wow. help you along with your social media posting. Cause really you need a degree to really oh, the create, the cr- Creating content is yeah. Oh, and it's exhausting. Exhausting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and some people just do it effortless, effortlessly. Yeah. It's not effortlessly for me. I don't like, no. I'm not a pull out the camera ever on my rides me either. <laughs> or, or on my runs. Like it's, it's never me that takes that photo. So it was like, well, now I've got to have someone come and follow me to get a bunch of content for my sponsors. Cause that's now what's in my contract. And, and so that all just became exhausting, um, in, you know, the latter years of my career, and sort of, I'm glad that I, I mean, I still have some amazing supporters and, um, you know, I'm now sort of an influencer for some brands, which, which is pretty cool that I get to still get paid a little bit of money to just promote some brands. But I, I had like 20 sponsors, you know, and then I'm like, okay, well I have to like mention each one of these sponsors at least once a month and get creative in how I do it every month. But I'm exhausted because I'm training 30 hours a week. So it just was like, yeah, this is a lot. <laughs> yeah, I've I've, uh, I've noticed that over the years, and I'm glad you touched on that because it's uh, it's one I hadn't thought of. But it really, uh, I was on my way out when it wasn't about always just winning the race. To your point, it was about who can have the greatest, who can show how much they're suffering on an indoor bike and everybody go, wow, you're training so hard. I'm like, what? I've been training in a dungeon for 20 years doing exactly <laughs> that, but I never videoed it. No. You know, I, I, so you're saying he <laughs> I suffers. Didn't know anyone wanted to see that. No, like, you're saying he suffers more than I do because he put it on Instagram. I was like, well, no, I'm uh, suffering yeah. in a quiet room, maybe with a bit of music in my ears on my own for hours at a time that no one saw. And I thought the scoreboard was enough, but yeah. it's no, they want to see how you got to, <laughs> got to yeah. there. To, and, oh. it, it, it became exhausting. And so for the athletes now, I mean, there's just so much like now, mm, mm. You know, I mean, even, you know, Julie's t- team who Julie coached me in the last you know year or two of my career, they were on a physiologist. And so now you're paying your coach and you're paying your physiologist and then you're paying your like your aerodynamics guy for the bike. It's like, 
whoa, like how much am I paying a month just for coaching here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, not just for coaching, obviously you're like, oh, money's to going out though, but yeah, money, a lot of money going out. You got to keep investing yeah. in yourself, but the investments seem to keep getting bigger and bigger and more diverse. Yeah, totally. So I know I just, it just seems to be coming, becoming more complicated. Mm. I'm glad that, that, that part of it, I missed, I sort of like, I mean, even Tim, he's like, yeah, my last couple of years of racing, I'm not going to hire a physiologist at this point. I've, I've gotten to pretty, pretty high up in the ranks and yeah. without doing any of that stuff and um, sort of figuring out on my own. So no, you're, you're right. You're right. Building your team now. Like if you and I were back at zero, it's okay. Coach, manager, physiologist, social media creation person. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of moving pieces to becoming not just trying to win a race. You have to be be an influencer and show people what you're doing. You have to be an open book. And uh, it's very different, isn't it? It's uh, it's because when you think about it, I got into this book because I, like you said earlier, whoever works the hardest can be the best in the world. Full stop. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's like whoever works the hardest, so long as they've got the right physiologist and doing the exact right training to the science, has somebody actually showing the world that what you're doing. Mm-hmm. All these other bits. <laughs> on on that, by the way, if anybody's listening, I um I'm pretty lousy at even promoting this podcast. So if anybody wants to help me out, <laughs> <laughs> I need somebody to get this out there even more um, because yeah. these conversations are the best in the world. I love I love having these conversations, you know, with people like yourself. It's been really cool. The technology, the other big one, I you know I've mentioned several times on this show I, recently is is these super shoes, mm-hmm. which I feel like people like yourself who are running a 252 or 251 marathon off the bike in, you know, K-Swiss shoes that basically you're basically running on pavement <laughs> barefoot yeah. to now you're getting catapulted down the road. I mean, yeah. it, that's changed a hell of a lot. So I got my first pair of super shoes like the week after my last race. <laughs> <laughs> so I raced uh, my last race, which I actually didn't know was my last race at the time, was Santa Cruz 70.3 and Hoker had finally come out with their yeah. first real super shoe. And I remember I saw Sarah Crowley. I'm like, you got a pair of the super shoes? I'm like, I didn't get any yet. And she's like, yeah, I had to like hound them for it because they're only just coming out. And then mine showed up on the doorstep a week later. Um, but I've never even run in them because I haven't done a hard run session <laughs> since. <laughs> no idea. Like, yeah, oh, I ran in K-Swiss. I ran in like the New Balance, but I opted for like – you know, their min- their most minimal yeah. shoe. Um, you know, my, my, my run record still stands, um, in Kona, uh, today, but, um, yeah, I think it's, <laughs> I think, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I thought for sure it was going to fall last year, but for some miracle it, it stayed. Um, yeah. What did the- Chelsea run last year? It was down there, wasn't it? She was in that. Well, like- 52 yeah, it, was, it was close yeah. it was close-ish but yeah those yeah. shoes uh, I've never run hard in them like like you're saying but I have tried them on and run down the ho- hotel hallway and just gone my goodness this is uh this is exceptional especially if you're somebody that hits the ground pretty hard the rebound effect is quite quite extraordinary yeah I mean and I'm like whatever I mean it's fine it's just more I wish I could see how far, you know, I wish I could go back and have the shoes and just see how far. Of course, of right? course. That's of course. all. Like, yeah, I just yeah. want to know. It's, yeah. all, it's the same as like knowing who's clean and who's doping. Like, I just want to know, are you clean or are you doping? Because I want to uh, know how I measure up, like yeah. on an even playing field. That's all. On that, what do you think about our sport? I mean, obviously we had Colin Chartier tested positive at EPO and I've been asked several times, people have written me, like, Greg, what do you think? What do you think about the sport as a whole? You know, do you think our sport is clean what, what what do you think tell me tell me your I thoughts know. i'm starting i'm starting to wonder i mean i think when i was racing at the highest level obviously i got to win um and so i'm like yeah. well surely not many people are doping and if they are then they're not doing very good because i could win you know <laughs> yeah. um but it just seems like the times are just getting insane. And obviously, yes, the, the shoe technology has come into it. Mm. Um, and cycling aerodynamics is just getting more and more sophisticated. And, and a lot of courses are a little nutty with like extra, mm. the front pack of men is just getting bigger. And so obviously that's going to create just a faster front pack. And then the motos around. So there's all of these other factors, but then like, you still like, that was still like legit crazy how fast mm. or how much power that athlete could hold and so I just wonder I don't know I just wish it, we could know right like I just yeah yeah no, like I think it's okay to have a healthy bit of skepticism that's what I do I I'm no I'm not I'm not ever mentioning names I have 
but like you, uh, and I look at people like Craig Alexander, Crowey and Simon Whitfield and Hamish Carter and all my mates, all my good mates that I grew up with from when I was yeah. 14, 15, 16. And we've all worked hard together and we all got to have our little moments of being the best in the world, you know, for little bits. None of yeah. us own it, but you get to have that little bit. And exactly like you're saying, I got to be the best. So it's kind of a part of you is like, well, hang on, if I made it, yeah. well, then I can't think there's much of it going on because, geez. Yeah. But then you also look around the sport and you go, well, that looks a little bit too good to be true, doesn't it? You yeah. know, it was like when you watched the Tour de France for years with, with yeah. you know, Lance and, and all, the, all of those guys and, and they're sprinting up these mountains and not getting tired at all, at all. And you're like, huh. I mean, I'm really, really fit, but even I, t- I get a tiny bit tired sometimes. <laughs> you kind of, if it yeah, kind if it looks. And I think, I think that, yeah, like you think how much, how tired you were and how much effort it took to like get up for Kona. And once a year, I could do that big race. And so maybe that was the difference. Like uh, maybe athletes were doping and they were able to sort of, you know, compete year round mm. very well. Whereas it took like myself, who, you know, was running on, water and you know Gatorade um or goo sorry I should say um all year all year of dedic and years and years of dedication and consistency to get that one performance on that one day um and have that special day whereas I don't know and and yeah I wasn't bouncing back and training the next day no, um no no there's no way like I couldn't even move I was absolutely the, the body breakdown physical, was emotional. insane yeah M- yeah Every, mental physical yeah the whole lot right yeah but yeah. i think like yeah if you're doping it must feel a lot easier <laughs> to <hit> your <laughs> when your recovery is so much quicker when you yeah. feel superhuman i mean that would be amazing like being able to just back up like hard sessions like you got to get one really good run session a week if you're lucky like one where you really nailed yeah. it and maybe yeah. maybe one bike as well like a week but if you're able to do that multiple times a week, that would be amazing. Like yeah. how fun would that be yeah. to just be like knocking me out of the park and recovering like no problem? Yeah. I mean. Look I, look, I think personally, I think our sport is still like really, really clean. Like I, I really do. Deep down I just, and maybe that's just me because I love the sport so much and I'm such a huge fan of all the, everybody doing it, you know, pros and amateurs. I, I, I just think, but I do think it's okay to have a healthy little bit of skepticism where you go, oh, maybe that performance was a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree. But I think with uh, Chartier going positive, um, I don't know, I hear he's been talking a, a little bit more and I'm hearing whispers of some some other oh. things you just don't know. Like, I don't know, like some other names being implicated, but again, like it's all hearsay, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Until, until you see the evidence, hard based evidence, cause I, I don't want to have a hearsay conversation cause it need, you know, I think the testing needs to, you know, be better. It needs to keep up. I think they got to ask the, ask the other professional athletes who do they think should get tested more often. Um, You know, I I don't know. There was one point, do you remember when I was getting, actually, I don't know if you and I were hanging out, but there was one point I was getting tested every 10 days for about six months. Yeah, you got tested a lot. And I was like. I think because you were on multiple tests because I was in the Australian and then the WTC for a while. Yeah, I was on multiple testing, but it was also, um, I didn't know what was going on. And you're like, am I, am I, taking something i'm not doing anything and you start to get yeah, worried like you're getting tested so yeah. much is one of my like vitamins yeah like, i'm like i'm not it's doing anything like, please element or something right yeah i mean it, it was terrifying throughout your career like you take a vitamin c and you're like oh wait, wait was this 30 third party te- like you get a cold and you're like i can't take anything you know like yeah. i'm so glad that i don't have to i mean not that to be going taking anything but still like i don't have to worry i'm like i can just the go stress to yeah. the chemist and grab a vitamin whatever like a cold and flu remedy if i've got a cold you know or like, the mist test the mist test did you ever i had two mist tests at one point i was like why not when i was down at whole foods I only got one yeah ever. and then I, but I had them two in the same block and there was and for people that don't understand you have to is it three months in advance or whatever it is put one hour where you're going to be um yep. And this was before we even had decent apps and things where you could do it. Like you, you were doing this on the web and then it would s- sit there. Well, yeah. And I, you know what else I believe <laughs> sucks for the mistesting? The athlete that's not t- doping doesn't think about no. <laughs> it every single day. The athlete that's doping is probably better up to date with their whereabouts, right? Like yeah. I'd like, I'd fill out that, those whereabouts and not even think about it. And then I'd be downtown like 
having dinner and it'd be my testing pool I'd, and I'll all of a sudden realize and then have like like a stress attack <laughs> yes. shows up my house you know like it was stressful yeah, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. was like please just put a tracker on my phone like that was it yeah. Test me any time, but put, you put know, a tracker under my skin. I was happy to put a tracker under my skin to that point. I'm like, happy to me. I just <laughs> treat me like a dog. <laughs> I know for me, when, when I retired myself, it was like, that was actually one of the big reliefs of just not having to fill out the whereabout forms and like worry about where I am an hour of every day, three months in front and worry about being called a drug cheat because I missed tests because I was busy just having dinner down at Whole Foods. I'm like, what? I didn't, I wasn't thinking about taking drugs yeah, to your be, point. Yeah. Out. Glad to be done with that. And I think a lot of people don't really, I mean, obviously all the professionals know, but because when I retired, I mentioned that I didn't have to do, I finally got pulled off the whereabouts and people like you, what you had to give an hour every, I'm like, yes. Like you have to account for an hour <clears throat> every single day of your life that you're going to be somewhere mm-hmm. forever, forever Eternity <laughs> until you retire. <laughs> yes. And it's, and, and, it, and the point is if you get three missed tests in, is it in six months or I don't know, I think it's within six months or maybe less or more. I, I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> In like a, within an 18 month period or a year period, it was a lot like yeah, long. Yeah, it, it was long. Three, yeah. te- but you got you would get a three month ban. Yeah, but not only that, it's not it's not that. I mean, yes, the three month ban really hurts, but it's the fact that now they're like, oh, you're avoiding drug tests. And you're like, no, I'm not. No. I just totally forgot because <laughs> I just don't care. like it's not on my radar. I know, I know. It's it's hyper stressful, and one thing that both you and I can agree on that. I'm glad we don't have to do any more. <laughs> where, where do you see the sport now? You know, with a PTO, you are heavily involved with that, with TO, getting that off the ground to begin with. Um, you know, Iron Man, the Challenge Family Clash, uh, Super League, the World Series. There's a lot. There's a lot of avenues for professionals, far more so than 10 to 15 years ago. Yeah. Do you think the sport's in a good place right now? I like to hope so. I mean, I think it's a little bit of a tipping point right now with, you know, the PTO coming on board. I think that that really has changed the perspective mm. for athletes. I feel like if the PTO didn't eventuate, then the future, I would, we would be having a different conversation because I feel like we would be, you know, I think the future of professional racing might be a little more dire, but mm. with the emergence of the PTO and more opportunity to race head to head, televised, um, obviously, professional athletes, the more races that can be televised, the more potential for, um, new sponsors and just sponsorship, sponsorship money and, um, opportunity for sponsors. So, uh, I, I see, uh, a bright future, uh, with the PTO growing. Um, but again, I think the next sort of year or two will sort of be really telling. I Mm. think if that really starts to take off, then we're golden. If, if it doesn't, Mm -hmm. then yeah, I mean, does the PTO go away in a few years and then Iron Man's back in the driving seat? I think it was good to see them ra- make a decent, you know, amount of raise some funds. Um, was that earlier this year or end of last year? Yeah, I think things def- certainly look really promising with the PTO and I think, yeah, um, yeah I'm, I like, I'm really, you know, proud of how far the PTO have gotten so far, um, but I yeah. just really hope that it keeps going and I think it will because – you know, the racing at the top level is insane and the level of quality, you know, the broadcasts are incredible. So uh, I, th- I think more and more, you know, general media interest will, will come from that. So Awesome. Okay, here, I want to finish up uh, the show because we've been chatting for a while. Final four. So Ooh. these are questions that I just want you to sort of reminisce a little bit. But first one, what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? Follow your gut. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. I mean, I honestly think my 18 year old self did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say anything. Just do what you're doing. Do Great. What you're doing. I, I yeah. love it. I love it. All right. Uh, which three people, non-family living or dead, would you like to have dinner with? Oh, I know. I didn't, I read this really quick. And I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was non-family. I was going to say my dad, he died in 06. Um, oh. And that was before I won any world titles and before obviously I met Tim and before I had my oh. kids. So that one would be a good one to actually yeah. have dinner with. Catch up with so dad. Care a lot with. And then Michael Jordan has always been my, hmm. um, you know, idol as a, as a young basketball player. Um, so him, and I don't know if I have a third. I'll come. 
they're the two that came to mind. I'll join you. <laughs> oh, GB. <do you laughs> okay, yeah. Because <laughs> you'd always be able to carry a good conversation if things got quiet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, I would get quiet. You can get quiet, but not 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 always. Not on a not the dinner time. No, not uh, with a few wines. No. <laughs> okay, next one. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Uh, hopefully, having have built a really big, uh, good coaching community. Tim and I have started. Oh, well, I've oh. we've started coaching community. I've started coaching, um, and yeah, we just want to build that community. Um, cool. Hopefully. It's thriving in five years' time. Where do they find you for this coaching community? Um, they can go on timandrini.com and that, that's how they can sort of ah. find all the information and then and then come and check out what we have to offer. Yeah, great. All right. I'll make sure we put that in the show notes as well. All right. And then um, here's one. And if you can't do it, that this is fine. But what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Look after your body. I think Siri... Siri sort of drove that home early in my career where, you know, was, and it's super simple. Like you're, you're asking a lot of your body, make sure you pay it back in return. And that means like eating well, that means getting good sleep. And that means Mm -hmm. like getting massage or if you have a niggle, you know, take care of it right away. So I think that served me really well through my career. Great advice. Awesome. All right. Now we're going to conclude with some rapid fire questions. Are you up for it? Yeah. All right. (laughs) What's the toughest race you've ever competed in? Um, I'm, these are not going to be rapid fire. I'm really some slow. of them. Are, some of them are more rapid than others. That one's probably a bit. <laughs> that one's a bit harder. <laughs> this race. Um, I did the Iron, French Iron Tour one year when I was pretty young. Like uh-huh. that was pretty tough. Four days of racing in a row. Yeah, that's cool. All right, next one: Tim Tams or Vegemite on toast? Oh, Tim Tams. Nice. I agree. First job. Bunnings Warehouse. Yeah. Well, I had to work on the farm as a kid, but yeah, first real job. Oh, I love it. Favorite training destination? Uh, I mean, I think, don't think you can beat Boulder, Colorado. Mm-hmm. One book you'd recommend? Oh, only one. I don't I haven't really read many books recently, but I did read I did read Lauren Fleshman's book recently, and this is just a recent read, um, Good for a Girl, and I thought that was a really good yeah, story. I've heard good things about that. Good for yeah. a Girl. Perfect. All right. If you could go back to any decade of your life, which one would it be and why? Probably, I don't know. It's a tough one because, well, oh, the 2010s probably. <laughs> this last yeah. decade, we're just coming off the back of it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Like I won three titles, got married <laughs> to Theo, had a baby. Like, yeah. Like, pretty good. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. Finn missed, missed that decade. He went. He was twenty twenty one, but only just. He's yeah, he was conceived though in that one. Yes, yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. First car. I had like a Ford Laser, like a hatchback. Cool. What color was it? Silver. Silver bullet. <laughs> All right. Favorite pizza topping. Ah, uh, I I like the old ham and pineapple. I know that's like. Wow. Yeah, that's going to create yeah. some. <laughs> I know. And it's going to create division in your <laughs> audience. If you were to enter a talent show, what would be your act? I don't have any talents, Greg. Oh, please. I just, like, I've just heard you sing. What's that thing bit? where you and T.O. and Laura and I tried to keep up once? We were sitting around a fireplace and you guys start singing and then, uh, <laughs> and then you have to start the new song or whatever. I, I had no idea what you guys were doing. Remember, do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, we would like – you'd you'd start, you'd sing a song and then the last word you'd have to think of another song that had that word in it and, and then sing the next like oh, two words. You guys were so good at that. So there you go. <laughs> that could be your act. That could, yeah. <laughs> but I, need, I need a friend up there to do it with Yeah, me. that's all right. You can bring T.O. with you. Yeah. All right, last one. What decade of music is the best? I like the 90s. All right, you and T.O. are the same on that one. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. 90s on nine. Rooney, what, what, what's, what's next for you? What do you go, you know, in this, I said five years from now, but what's coming up, you know, this Not year right or next? Now. Yeah, I'm just, honestly, I just started coaching um, yeah. like three months ago and I'm really loving it. I'm coaching with TriDot. Um, so TriDot is a, an AI technology that can write the program. Um, it's incredible what it can do. Um, so, you know, I, I retired and didn't really know what I would want to do other than obviously 
you know, spend a lot of time with the well, kids. Well, raising and, children is is pretty huge. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, you know, we met with TriDot and, yeah, sort of learnt about that. But basically the program is written for the athlete once they put in all of their information. Mm. And then I go in and make adjustments that I see necessary and then I get to help with all the other bits and pieces. You know, like I think uh, maybe it's a little different now, but I felt like when we were training – everyone was sort of doing the same thing, right? Like, mm. you know, two hard runs, two hard bikes, you know, you know, three key swims or whatever a week. And the rest was sort of zone two or one, two or whatever, or strength. And the, but the athlete on the start line that won was the one who had their head screwed on, right. And had all the other bits and pieces squared away. So it was not just the programming, right. It was the magic mm. that was created in the group and the training environment and the coach and, and all the other um, pieces of the puzzle. And so having this algorithm, right, you know, do a, the bulk of the, you know, programming work allows me to then go in and optimize obviously the program itself, but then look into more deeply other areas that might be limiting mm -hmm. factors, you know, like, I don't know, nutrition or aerodynamic issues or, you know, just having the time to like get to know the athlete a little better. I think any professional coach with, you know, 15, 20 athletes or more, you can't really, when you're doing, when your head's in the numbers all the time, you can't really get to know the athlete and sort of work on, you know, all of the other ancillary pieces that it takes to have a great race. So this allows me to sort of use my experience um, and, you know, over 20 plus years of racing and being in the sport to, you know, sort of share that and identify areas that, you know, the athlete can work on outside of just swim, bike, run. That's awesome. Uh, All right. Well, we'll make sure that people know where you guys are on that. That's very cool. Imagine having three-time Ironman world champion, one of the greatest ever to do the sport, being your coach, having the AI generated tool to get a lot of the tedious work out of the way. So you can really just have that, that connection with people. My little squad's full for right now. Um, I, I will take on some more athletes, but I'm only really slowly. I'll add a few more athletes in a couple of months, but I'm up to 16 already. And wow. we haven't really done any marketing yet. All right. Well, forget everything I said, everybody. You're missing no, out. Please, no, I'm just please, kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm now in the process of, because we also do have a community level where yeah. you don't get one-on-one -on -one coaching, but you you will be a part of our community. And we'll of course, of course. I'm and teasing. then we also bring on like Joe Gambles is going to be one of our coaches. And um, I'm looking at, you know, some other coaches to bring on board as well. So we will have a place for everyone. I'm just sort of in the thick of figuring out how that structure works. Um, and I will be adding more athletes and there will be spots, you know, I have a couple of athletes racing Kona who may or may not continue coaching at, you know, high level is sort of a mm. bit of a revolving door at times. So there will yeah. be opportunities um, to join my squad, but. Uh, awesome, Rooney. Well, honestly, congrats on the retirement. Congrats on just one of the most stellar careers. Uh, hopefully that means we all get to hang out a little bit more once our kids can get a little bit older here so we can all hang out and travel a bit. Yep. But I thoroughly enjoy just catching up with you, Rini, um, you know, sharing your journey and everything you've gone through. It's a really insightful and very cool conversation. So I appreciate you for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Greg. It's uh, really good to catch up with you as well. I hope we cross paths in person sooner than later. Um, yeah, get our kids together because um, yeah. they're really at fun ages. They are at fun ages. All right. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening. Um, you can find all the show notes, timestamps and everything else at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. Thanks a lot for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.